Can't deny your heart for mine, and it's unrelenting chase. I was on the edge of deception, caught up in my hesitation until you.
just to know you with all my heart I threw my shame away, all of my sin erased This isn't the end of the story I'll trust in what you say, told me I'll be okay It's turning around for your glory I know when the light comes, I'ma keep my head up hey, You won't let me down, let me down With me in the middle, middle of my battle hey, You won't let Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my turn Till I Now your mercy has saved my soul
Well, good morning, VOC. Come on, would you stand to your feet? How's everybody doing this morning? Anybody excited to be here at church? Yes. I want to introduce a new one to you that we're going to celebrate uh, and sing next week. Anybody excited for Easter and the resurrection? And so introduce a new one. It's real simple. It talks about who our God is and, and what he's done for you. And let me introduce this chorus. It goes like this. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. Deep the great heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Yes. Come on, put your hands together. Like this. Come on, he is risen. He is good. Come on, sing this out. Remember. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame. They were like prison. We couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Yes, Sam. Remember those giants? Remember those giants we called and grave But they were like mountains that stood in our way Then he came and he died and he rose Those giants are dead now Yes, come on sing, this is our God This is our God, this is who he is He loves us this is our God, this is what He does, and He saves us. He blew the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Yeah! Remember that fear that took our breath away. Come on. Faith so weak that we could barely pray. Yes, Jesus. Oh, yes. Now there's altar in the wilderness. Yes, come on. This faithful mess. Yes. But he fell. But he did, he saves us. He pulled the cross, beat the grave, and let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Who pulled me out of that pit? He did, he did. Who paid for all of our sins? Nobody but, come on, sing it out. And who pulled me out of that pit? He did, he did. And who paid for all of our sins? Nobody but, yes, sing it out. Who rescued me from that? Come on. Yahweh, Yahweh. Who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Come, nobody but Jesus. Yes. Huh. Yahweh, Yahweh. Gives the glory and come on. Nobody but him. This is our God. This is who he is. Yeah. He loves us. This is our God. This is who he does. He saves us. Upon the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven in a proclaim. This is our God. He Jesus. We thank you. Yeah, we praise you, Jesus. Come on. 
Come on, praise Him in this place. Yes. Come on, can we celebrate Jesus all in this room? Hallelujah. Yes. We worship you, Father. We worship you. We're so grateful for you. Come on, sing all my words, fall short. All my words fall short. I got nothing there. Could I express all my gratitude? I can sing these songs, yes, as I often do. Every song must stand, and you never do. Ain't that true? Come on. So I threw up my hands, praise you again and again. All that I have is the hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much. But I'm nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing Hallelujah, yes Hallelujah Yeah, come on I've got a one response I've got just one move, yes with my arms stretched wide, I will worship you, yeah. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. So all that I have is the hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, no, it's not much, and I know it's not much. sing your own song in this room hallelujah yeah. come on. so come on my soul don't you kiss shy on me lift up your song cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs so get up and praise the Lord come on across this room yeah, we you up. so come on my soul yeah. don't you kiss shy on me lift up your song You've got a lion inside of you. Nothing else, nothing else 
going to celebrate the, the death of Christ because that was the only way that you and I could have eternity in heaven. Anybody thankful for the cross and what he did for you? And, but it was the blood that was spilled. And it was the only necessary thing that would save us and spare us was the blood. In fact, God did it back in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve sinned. And what did they put on themselves? Fig leaves. And God said those fig leaves are insufficient for you. They cannot hide your shame. They cannot hide your nakedness. And so what did God had, what did he have to do? He had to kill an animal, an innocent animal, and put a garment of skin over Adam and Eve. There had to be blood spilt. There had to be blood spilt so Adam and Eve could live. And that was just a foreshadow of what would happen years later when his son would be on a cross and there would be blood that had to be spilt because our own religion was not sufficient enough. Our own works were not sufficient enough. What we did and how much we did was not enough. And God said, I need you to know about the blood. It's the blood that washes away your sin. It's the blood that removes all your iniquities. It's the blood that he gives you an opportunity to be in the presence of God and to spend eternity in heaven. Anybody thankful for the blood? Father, so we worship you. What can wash away our sin with the blood? Come on, let's sing this all in. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Sing the 
Come on, church, you can get louder than that. Can we celebrate God for a moment? I wanna, I wanna just take a moment, I wanna echo what our, what our lead pastor said about the blood. That's something that's been, that the Lord has been using to minister me this, this past week, these past two weeks. It's about the blood. Paul said, it's not what you did. You can't boast about it. It's everything that he did. So come on, can we, get, can we give God some more praise in this place this morning? Y'all may be seated. Good morning. We're so grateful that you are here. If, if you don't know who I am, uh, my name's Eddie. I'm the student director here at VLC. And uh, I, I can't tell you how much of an honor and a privilege it is just to, just to be here with you guys, right? Just to see you guys again. That last night's disappointment in losing two Florida teams for, for a national championship didn't, didn't, didn't cause you to just stay home this morning. We're glad that you were able to make it here. And uh, we're so grateful that you are here. Can we welcome our family that's tuning in online with us this morning? Good morning to you guys as well. We're so grateful that you are here and we love you. And uh, for, for everybody here in this service, I, I just wanna let you know that you aren't here by accident. We've been praying for you. We've been happy to, we've, been, we've just been expecting for the spirit to move. And, and we're just, again, so grateful that you are here. And maybe today is the very first time that we've had the opportunity to cross paths with you. And uh, me as a part of our staff who've been praying for you, we, we are excited to connect with you. And one of the ways we do that is we've got one of these connect cards. Uh, if you maybe don't know what this is, you've never seen this before, uh, you can find this underneath the seat in front of you. And really what we want you to do is, if you can, would you grab it? And whenever you have a moment, would you fill it out with as much information as you feel comfortable sharing with us today? And uh, maybe you're here and you're, you're one of the people that just kind of likes to come, stay in the back, be low key, and then once service is out, leave. Um, can I ask you, maybe that is you, there's a, there's a tent that's right outside, right to your right hand side, and we want you to hand this to those who are laboring underneath these harsh Florida morning conditions, okay? We want you to be able to hand this over to the person underneath the tent, and it's not because we gain something out of this, it's because we've got something that we want to give to you, and it's free, all right? Can we, can we just, first off, can we celebrate free these days, because nothing comes for free, but also, can we, can we celebrate even more for the fact that there are people here for the very first time this morning? Come on. Whew, I'm already out of breath. But uh, there's a couple of things I wanna kinda keep you in the know about. I've got two massive, two massive announcements for you this morning. The first one is next week. Somebody say next week. Next week, people, we got Easter service happening. Come on, Easter service. We, this is the opportunity we have to come together as a family and we get to celebrate the fact that our savior was not conquered by death, that he rose again, right? That he lives in you and in me today. We get to celebrate that together. And we, we have the opportunity, we have the honor and the privilege not to just do it once, but we get to do it twice. Next week, we are gonna have two services. Our first one is gonna be at 930 Maybe that's a little too early for you. Don't worry, we got your back. We've got another service at 11, 15. And uh, again, we just can't wait for you guys to be a part of that. Just so you know, bring your littles, bring all the littles that you can. We've got an Easter egg hunt happening after each service that we're really excited for. If you uh, maybe wanna slide me a five or a $10 bill, I'll look the other way while you go and uh, ruin the kids event. If you want a couple of eggs for yourself, that's okay. You can do that. Um, I also think uh, our, our lead pastor might've made a mistake in uh, announcing a bounce house. Uh, we looked at our budget. We definitely don't have enough for a 300 foot bounce house. I don't know if he announced that last week, but I got his back. Uh, it is, it, we're gonna have a bounce house. It's gonna be awesome, uh, but definitely not one the size of a football field, all right? We're gonna keep it modest, all right? But it's gonna be a good time. We want you to be a part of that. Uh, and you might've seen one or two of these laying, laying around somewhere. Um, our hope and our prayer for, as, as a staff is to be able to just we don't want any more of these. All right, we have put 90% of our church, but no, I'm kidding. We have put some money towards all these church invites and we want you to go out, maybe invite your family, maybe invite your friends, maybe invite your coworkers to this because there's no better time to invite a friend to church than Easter, amen? Come on, so we don't wanna see any more of these. Go and invite people out so that next week we can come together and just go nuts over the Lord. Does that sound fun? Does that sound good? Sound dandy? All right. 
If I haven't put you to sleep yet, I do have one more announcement I want to make to you guys. Uh, the week after Easter, we're going to be hosting an after party. So maybe you're like confused. You have never, well, maybe you've heard those words before, but definitely not in church. All right, the after party gives us the ability to just kind of gain in, in fellowship with you. If that makes sense. This is all for you. We, we don't, like, this is just to be able to get to know you guys better. And uh, what better way to get together than with, with some free food? Y'all are going to get fed, all right, both, you know, spiritually, because we do have service too, but physically as well, all right? I don't know what we're getting yet. I've not been let into the details, but there will be food. There will be ice cream. There will be a good time. So we're excited to see you there. Again, just invite your friends. We want to be able to celebrate with you guys as much as we can. And uh, maybe if you have any other questions, if you're curious to know what else might be going on here, um, just in this building here at VLC. We do make all that information freely available to you on our website at vlcministries.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, on Instagram. If you're still using that, you can follow us on social media for any other details, maybe something that I missed, maybe something that I said wrong, uh, like a 300-foot bounce house, maybe one of those things too. All that is online. Um, and at this time, I, I, wanna, I wanna go ahead and I wanna pray for our offering if that's okay. Obviously, before I do that, just want to remind you guys, as I'm sure you're tired of hearing by now, uh, I want to encourage you that there's still, there's a few ways that you can give, right? The first one, there's some boxes in the back. If you maybe like to just turn in your offering, like physically, in physical, seeable form, uh, there's a box in the back that you can kind of drop your offerings in. Of course, you can also choose to mail it right here to this location, Victory Life Church. You can also go online vlcministries.com slash give. And if you're looking for like some crazy convenience, you can also text the word VLC plantation to 77977. And uh, at this time, I wanna go ahead and I wanna pray for our offering. Heavenly Father, you are so good. And it's because of your goodness that we get to come into your house today wearing your jersey. We get to be on your team. We get to be co-laborers in this whole thing because you've allowed us to. And Father, we are so grateful for that this morning. God, I pray for any hurt. Maybe there was somebody else that maybe didn't, they weren't good stewards of, the, of your money. I pray, Lord, that those who are here today after having faced that, they would be able to separate that from you. That was not your will. But Lord, you will for us to be co-laborers in this thing with you. And we are praying that your hand would move mightily in the little that we have to offer you. We are praying, Lord, that those, who are, that those who are giving today is not out of obligation. It's not out of the, just this mundane situation that we're in about just church and we got to do all the right church things. I pray, Lord, that our offering is purely about seeing your kingdom move, seeing others being blessed by, by the finances that, that we've put in, the little that you've asked us to give. I pray, Lord, that there would be people who are eager to see how you move amongst those who don't even know you because that's what this is about. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your presence. We're so grateful you would use us. And Father, we love you so much. And it's in Jesus' name, all God's people in this place said, amen, amen. We are gonna head back into worship, but do me a favor, would you stand to your feet? Would you shake somebody's hand, somebody who's next to you, say hello and ask them which service are they gonna be a part of next week?
Jesus, you said, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that there's no other way, that Jesus is the way to the Father and Jesus is Lord. And so we willingly bow before you now instead of being forced to bow before you. Lord, best as possible, this congregation loves you. We in the leadership, we adore you. We bow before you. We confess to you. We give to you. We talk about you. We read about you. We testify about you. And everything is dedicated to you that we have and who we are. We pray that the Holy Spirit would have his way in this place. We are praying that your Holy Spirit would fall upon us in power. Some people use the word, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, we know that the Holy Spirit has come upon your people over and over again and baptized with power, not so that we can walk away and say, oh, wow, we experienced something, but that we would see a visible manifestation of the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. So we pray there are people that are ill and that are hurting. We pray that your power might be present here in this place. And that if not today, soon, we will see healing for your glory and honor. We pray, Father, that there are some here today that are, they need the wall of bitterness broken down today so that they can look over at that wonderful person in front of them and be able to embrace them just like you embrace us when we come confessing our sin to you. Oh, the needs are great and many. And you came first and foremost to meet that greatest need of salvation. And pray that you will do that today with some people that may be looking in online and some people that are present here this morning. So we want to sing to you again, Father, in a great way again. Worthy, worthy, worthy is that name. Would you stand with me as we once again pray to God and sing to him? Worthy, worthy is his name. Would you stand and sing with me again? place this morning that is our heart's desire is that you be held in high esteem in this place what we can't do father what we can't do all things are possible with you that today as we sing about you talk about you give to you and preach about you and teach about you we know that you can 
touch the heart of everyone listening in online this morning as well as present this morning in a way that they will leave this place and say, I've enjoyed you, Father. I've enjoyed you, Jesus. I've enjoyed you, Holy Spirit. Walking away encouraged to live their lives for you is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. You may be seated at this time. Well, here I am again. You're probably, well, I preached last week. You're wondering why Jacob's not preaching this week. But um, next, this uh, coming Easter will probably be the first time that I haven't preached on an Easter message in a long, long time. So Jacob's going to have that privilege. And so I'm going to be bringing you this morning's message. I want to talk a little bit about that last week that Jesus was on this earth. And there's, there's so many things we could cover this time. But when I think about that last week that Jesus was on the earth... It reminds me of many funerals that I have presided over. And I, I, t- I entitled the message at funerals, It's a Sad, especially for a Christian, but a happy time. For a believer, it is a sad, but it is a happy time. Sad because they no longer have, they're not going to get their email at this human address anymore. They're not going to receive any more texts, no more phone calls, no more visits. So it's, it's a sad time to see your loved one to go on and be with the Lord. But it's a happy time for that individual. And you should be happy for that individual too. And not be selfish and say, God, I want to hang on to this person. You, by the way, a lot of people have gotten mad at God because they took away someone that they love very much. You must always be willing to release to God what is not yours. Everything belongs to God. So if God decides he wants to take a loved one on a little early and start letting that individual enjoy his glory, why would you want to interfere in that? So today I want to mention a few things that I thought about when Jesus spent his life on this earth in that last five, six days. The first thing I want you to think about is what you do for God. There's about four or five lessons. What you do for God will be remembered. And it reminds me of the passage of Scripture when Jesus was camped out at Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house. And the the things that were about to transpire were not very good. But there was some good things, though, that he began to articulate to all of us. But while he was in this home, here's what took place in Matthew 26, 7. A woman came to him with an alabaster jar of a very expensive perfume, which he poured on his head as he was reclining at the table, just so you kind of know where he's at. Again, he's just on the east side of Jerusalem, uh, sort of in the slopes of Mount Olive. And he's at Mary and Martha's house and Lazarus' house. And most theologians believe Simon the leopard was either Martha's brother or he was Mary and Martha and Lazarus' daddy. And they're at their home. And boy, they had, didn't they have so much to be thankful of? Simon the leper was healed. And uh, Mary and Martha had prayed, and they thought Jesus didn't answer their prayer. But only after their brother died, he came and he did answer their prayer in a greater way than they ever anticipated. And he raised Lazarus from the dead. Oh, they had so much like you and me to be thankful for to God. And she was, and she showed it around that table by opening an alabaster box full of perfume, which she poured on his head and in some other books of the Bible, also on his feet as he was reclining at the table. Of course, not having their spiritual antennas on, the apostles or the disciples saw this, and they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Mm, All of a sudden, they're thinking about the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, 
Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. Now, I want to bring out a couple situations. One is a lot of things that religious people do, and by the way, you're going to be seeing this brought up over and over again in this morning's message. Because Jesus has a lot to say about the people that you and me look to. And there's a lot of things you and me see on television that are held in high esteem by religious leaders. And you think, wow, great will be their reward when they get to heaven based on all the things I hear about and see them doing. And the large congregations they have, wow, God's going to be rewarding them in a big way. But I want to remind us in a sad way and then in a positive way about the things that we seemingly do for God. A lot of what you see on television, a lot of what you see around the churches of America will not last, but they will be burnt up because they've been fooling America. Now remember, when Jesus addresses these religious leaders, you think, how can he come down so hard on the religious leaders? Because they were the very people that you were to go to, that sinners were to go to, to find the truth and find their way to heaven and to the Father. He reminds us, and every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. He said, by their fruit, you'll recognize basically believers in God. And he reminds us and them that their work will be shown for what it is because the day, the judgment day, will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burnt up, the builder will suffer loss now, he's talking to believers, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. They asked, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? A year's wages. You see, she did something that many of us would think was insignificant, but she did something that will be remembered and has been remembered for over 2,000 years. Matthew 26, 13, Jesus reminds us of this fact. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. There's a lot of things you think compared to the giants you see on television and, and the churches throughout our land and throughout the world. You think, I've done nothing, and it pales in comparison to what Billy Graham has done, and perhaps God won't even remember what I've done for him. But see, something so small as this has been told for over 2,000 years. And I want to encourage you this morning that there are things that you have done for the Lord Jesus Christ that he will not forget and he has remembered and will remember and will reward you for that. Can you think of a couple other incidences in the Bible where perhaps only one thing was said about that individual in the Bible and it has been remembered? What about when baby Jesus came into the temple and there was a lady and a man that was there. And what they did has been remembered for over 2,000 years. And you might think, that's insignificant. But to God, it's not. He said, if you give a cup of cold water to someone that's poor and you do it in my name, you will be rewarded for it. They were faithful to be in that temple because God told Simon or Simon that, listen, you stay here. You're not going to die you can fly, get on a train, get on a boat. You can jump out of a plane. You're not going to die until you see Jesus. How would you like to have that prophecy given to you? Man, there'd be a lot of bold things you and me would be doing in the name of Jesus. I can't be touched. He was faithful into the temple. 
And then he saw baby Jesus, and you wonder, what was it? What, did something happen? Did, did the baby speak? How did he know that that was Jesus? Well, God opened his eyes. That one thing he did in the temple when he told Joseph and Mary, he is the Messiah. And it has been remembered for over 2,000 years. And there was a lady in there, too. And she spent, after she got, her husband passed away, she stayed serving God for the rest of her life. And she did not remarry. And she also saw baby Jesus in the temple and told Mary and Joseph about that. And that story has lived on for over 2,000 years. But there's another story that has made a profound impact. And the guy barely said a sentence or two. And he's been remembered for over 2,000 years and has provided hope for a lot of people. Can you think of what that was? Dun, 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 dun. The thief on the cross. The thief on the cross never did anything his whole entire life. But don't think so much about the thief. I want you to think about Jesus, what he did for the thief. All he did was said, we deserve what we got. But he, you don't deserve what you've got. Would you remember me, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus said, today, today you'll be with me in paradise. That story has been told for over 2,000 years. Saints, you have been serving God. You have been doing what you would call the little things. You've been over there in children's church, and, and they're serving over there, taking care of the noisy kids so you have a, a little bit more of a peaceful setting so you can hear the word of God and worship him without your kids running around in between you. God remembers those things that you have been doing for him. So be encouraged today. Continue to be faithful in those small things, and I will make you ruler over many things. Well, another thing I think about lessons I learned in the last week that Jesus walked the face of this earth, I'll call it prophecy that has been fulfilled. Jesus knew it was time for prophecy to be fulfilled. Remember, he came into Jerusalem riding on a what? Mighty white horse, right? Okay, I see someone's awake. <laughs> Boy, don't raise your hand whoever said that. <laughs> He said in Zechariah 9.9, 9, this happened the last week. Jesus was on the face of this earth. He's ready to be the king over all Israel. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughters Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. While that was happening, it's amazing, they brought it to Jesus. They threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully praise God and in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Uh, seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now, it's amazing that Jesus knew that prophecy must be fulfilled and he must come riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. It's amazing that the religious leaders, again, here we go, back on the religious leaders. Jesus is warning us over and over and over again. Open your spiritual eyes. See the times that you're living in. The religious leaders heard all about and saw all the miracles that Jesus had been doing. In fact, when he was in a church service and healed a man's shriveled up hand, they didn't get glad. They got mad. And they wanted to kill him. Then he raises Lazarus from the dead. They don't get glad, they get mad, and they make plans to kill Jesus. 
These are the religious leaders that stand in the pulpits of America and around the world and are allowing evil to infiltrate the church. The people that you and I look up to. And God has warned us in his last week on the face of this earth. Be on your guard. I'm going to give you some clues to look at when the religious leaders don't know the signs of the time they're living in. Don't put confidence in them. Put confidence in his word. Here's what the religious leaders said about some of this in Luke 19. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus. Now, now, before I get to this, it it may seem kind of weird me picking on these religious people. But if someone stood in the pulpit today and began to speak about some of the religious leaders that you open your heart and your television set to on a regular basis, preacher, why are you saying things about these guys? Now, I haven't mentioned anybody yet. I'll try to do my best not to mention anybody yet. And you remind me not to mention anybody, okay? But what if Jesus was standing here today warning you of all these religious leaders? That's what he was doing in his day. These were the, these were the great heavyweights of the greatest religion in the world. And people flocked to them. And they spent money there. And they traveled all over to see and hear these religious people. And Jesus had very, very little good to say about these leaders. And yet you're embracing all these religious leaders as if they were God himself. And many of them are leading churches and people astray, doctrinally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. Paul warned us of that. Jesus warned us of that. Moses over and over warned, when I go, you're going to marry into other cultures, you're going to marry foreign women, and you're going to embrace their gods, and you're going to stop serving me. Moses warned everyone of that. John the Baptist warned everyone of that. The apostle Paul warned everybody of that. And Jesus in his last week warns us of this. And yet you get your dandruff up if we mention one thing about some of these religious leaders who look so wonderful and so beautiful and dress so nice and seem so eloquent and are so big and so large. How dare you say anything against them? And yet little by little they're subtly deviating from God's word and teaching that to you and me. He goes on to say, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. (laughs) He said, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. So as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, I love it. To read about Jesus because you really see the love and compassion and mercy God has for his people. He wept over it. When's the last time we wept for a plantation? For the city of Fort Lauderdale. Or the condition we find our country in. Have we shed any tears? Are we emulating Jesus? He said, "If, if you, even you, had known on this day what would bring you peace. Here I am. I'm right here. You heard all about the miracles. No one's ever done the things I've done. You can't see with your eyes how blind you are. But now, all these things that you've heard, you've seen, you're not going to know anymore. He said, they will be hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side and they will dash you to the ground you and the children within your walls they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming Jesus said if the in in Luke 23:31 you might jot that down he said if they will do these things while the tree is green what will happen when it is dry If they'll do that while God is present on earth, what would they do when he's gone is basically what he's saying. What's amazing, though, about prophecy, it was the simple sinners that saw everything that Jesus was speaking about. It wasn't the religious people that went to college and seminary and got their doctorate degrees. It was the common people who hadn't gone to seminary and college 
but saw the things that Jesus did. Remember in Luke 5, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belong to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you, Jesus, eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinner. And Jesus continued in Matthew 21, the blind and lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Here's how the religious leaders acted. But when the chief priest, that would be like a, one of the top Christian dogs in our country. That's who he's speaking to. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, Jesus replied. Have you never read? Did you ever open your Bible? Or is it sitting on your table in your home or on your nightstand? If you'd open up and crack open the Bible and really read it, it said, from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. Isn't it amazing? Here we are in the last days. I do believe we're living in the last days. Do you agree we're living in the last days? Amen? And a lot of people don't see the signs of the time. And it was sinners that just got saved that perceived that Jesus was the son of the living God. It was not the pastors in the churches throughout the land and throughout the world. Guys, you, you think I may be stretching it? But just think. Go back and Jesus is talking to, you guessed it, all the pastors and the clergies that existed in his day. Wide is the path that leads to destruction. Broad is the gate, the gate that leads to destruction. Narrow is the path that leads to eternal life. And small is that gate. Jesus warned us in advance. Not necessarily to go along with popularity. God will help you and me see the things that are right before our own eyes today. Then I think about something else in his last week that ties into everything I'm saying. Again, it's a sad time, but it's a happy time. He did a lot of rebuking in that last week. He, he rebuked the tree. You think, well, what the heck did the tree do that the tree got rebuked? I mean, it was just standing there minding its own business. No, it wasn't minding its own business. It wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. So Jesus is making his way out of Bethany, back into Jerusalem, and he rebukes a tree. Imagine a tree. Remember, he said, if we don't praise him, the rocks will quiet, cry out and praise him. Imagine what the trees will do. They'll be swaying. Well, he gave us an object lesson on faith as well as a rebuke in that particular passage. Seeing a fig tree by the road in Matthew 21, he went up to up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. <laughs> he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately, the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did that fig tree wither so quickly, they asked them. I mean, they're still not getting it. They're talking to the Son of God. They, they were in a boat with him, and when he told the wind to shut up and be still, when he told the sea to calm down, and when he raised the dead, isn't it amazing? They, they still didn't get it. Sometimes look at all the things that God has done for you and me. Only within the next day or next week or next hour, next minute, we turn our backs on him. He said this, though, truly I tell you, if you had the faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what has been done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. I don't know, I tangled with God about this last week or this week and said, God, are, are we, did you? Now, he gave the authority to the 70, right? He gave the authority to the 12. So do we have any authority today? We have authority over the enemy, right? Who has he left the authority to? The church. 
He has left the authority to the church to do great and mighty things in his name. So we need to begin to ask the question, whose fault is it? God's fault or our fault? Does he still want to do great and mighty things? Is he still advancing his kingdom? How is he going to advance his kingdom? In signs and wonders. And one of the greatest wonders is when a heathen begins to cry out to God and begin to praise him. Well, Jesus is on a roll now. He rebukes the tree, and then he goes into the temple, and he starts continuing rebuking in the house of God, in the church. Oh, yeah, in the church. Oh, Jesus wouldn't come into the churches today and rebuke people, would he? Oh, you don't know him. Here's what he said when he came into the temple, into the church. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you're making it into a den of robbers. All throughout America, I see so many of our churches that are businesses instead of a house of prayer. Jesus rebuked the religious leaders for turning his place into a place of business instead of a place of worship. This was the pinnacle of all places to worship God, Jerusalem, the temple that he rebuked. Not only the rebuke, the temple, businessmen and business leaders, but also if you begin to read in Matthew 23... Once again, it was all the religious leaders of our day now put us back into his time that he begins to spew out, you hypocrites, you hypocrites, you hypocrites, because they were deceiving the people that were trying to come to God to find salvation. Here's what he said in just two, two quick ones, Matthew 23. Verse 2 said, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seats. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Now, am I trying to say to you that I'm the only preacher that's preaching the truth? No, I'm not trying to say that at all. But Christians need to open up their eyes very clearly to see what's going on around them. After all, it's recent converted sinners that seem to be able to understand the truth better than those who've been to college and seminary and have their PhDs. It's the common people that seem to advance the kingdom of God. He said about these religious people, think about them. Everything they do is for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. In other words, our religious leaders, Jesus is saying, a lot of what they do, put on your spiritual antennas. You see, we prayed around our athletes. We prayed around our successful businessmen and women. And so, you know, the religious leaders say, well, well we, we want to be like them too. Start parading us around. We want to sit at the best seats. We want to always be the one called upon to pray. We want to have the largest audience. We want everybody to come see us. Instead of, uh, like what one minister told Jacob and I this week as we were talking to him, or someone said, you know, when the church gets big enough where you have to have multiple services, he says, well, what about starting new churches? Instead of making your name famous, I've always thought this for many years. Why does your name have to be in every single church? Are you saying the church is not going to grow and exist unless your face and your name is there? Now, you may say that's easy for you to say because you don't have these multiple churches. But who, who are we pointing people to? Are we pointing them to us or are we pointing to him? That's what Jesus warned us about when he's telling us these passages these religious leaders do everything because they want the praise of men and women, just like our athletes and our singers do. He said to us about them, woe to you teachers. Here's one of the big reasons why he warns us. You teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Oh, my, I, 
Wow. You travel over land and sea. You get on these fancy jets that you have about two or three of them, and you have houses everywhere you go to win a single convert. And when you have succeeded, ha, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Do you understand why Jesus warns you and me about these religious leaders? And you might get mad if I pick out something little. If they divert from the truth and they begin to permeate the church with it, with it, you as believers need to stand up. Some people think that we have no accountability as pastors. I said, listen, we got enough strong people in this church, men and women, that if Jacob and I began to spiral away from God's word, we would have a lot of people confront of us. In fact, we might have a lot more no's. I heard someone say no a while ago that, that would speak loud and clear. Preacher, you aren't preaching the truth. Because we have a lot of people in this place that love Jesus Christ. And they would be able to distinguish between what, what's right and wrong. But he warns us over and over again. Who are the people that you hold in high esteem, that you listen to on the radio, that you watch on the television, that's even here in Fort Lauderdale, we're going to go from this church to this church to that church to this church to that church, because we, they, they must be doing something special down there. Jesus warns us, Satan is not going to come in the pulpit dressed in a red suit with a pitched fork and a pointy tail and pointy ears then you would know for sure it's the devil. And if he came in here, started saying some other things that were not truthful, you would easily detect it. But he's going to that preacher, or those churches, are going to do the very same thing that Satan did in the garden. He didn't say there's no God to Adam and Eve. But he began to challenge God on what he said. And so these preachers stand in the pulpits of America. They did it in our Lord's day, and they were leading people astray. And they led the whole nation of Israel astray, and even the Roman government astray, to tell them to kill Jesus. Don't tell me these ministers can't lead you astray today, and you're walking around saying, oh, they love him. Listen with your ears and your spirit to find out what they're saying. If it doesn't line up with the word of God, you check the box and go, I'm moving on. Well, there's a few people that like the truth here, I see. Then he went into Jerusalem, another rebuke. So you're going to find all about how we rebuke the religious leaders, but then he goes in and he rebukes Jerusalem, the hub of spirit. True spiritual worship for the whole world. He goes in and says, it's over with. Ichabod, I'm going to destroy you off the face of this earth. That's how much bad you have done to the people of God and all over the entire world. They know about it. He destroyed it. He says to them, when the apostles ask, oh, isn't this a, such a beautiful church? Isn't it wonderful? Oh, they love you, God. People from all over the world come here. You ordained this place to be a, a beacon of light to the world. Oh, isn't this an awesome place, Jesus? Hmm. He said, do you see all these things? Truly, I tell you, not one stone will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. And then he begins to warn us in chapter 24. This is the last week he's on the face of this earth. He begins to warn them in Jerusalem that destruction is coming. And too many eschatological theologians try to tell us in Matthew 24 that everything's for the end, 2,000 years, 3,000 years. Instead of reading the scripture in context that much, if not most, of what's being said had everything to do with the destruction of Jerusalem and to wipe out the whole Jewish system. And now the real light would be the Jews and the Gentiles together. Spreading the good news all over the world, not Jerusalem as the center hub. It was finished. Jesus, God, loved Jerusalem. He warned them, let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. 
how dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in the winter or on Sabbath. Truly, here's the key phrase that many theologians try to take out of context. Remember, this is what I got my doctorate in eschatology, but the problem is I don't know more than I knew back then, so I'm still confused. But there are some things you and me can know. There are some things you and me can know. It says, this generation and too many theologians, too many PhDs have tried to communicate to you and me that's for two, three thousand years from now. That was that generation. He said, it's all, all the blood of all the prophets that you killed, including the Son of Man, is coming on this generation. Did his word come true? Absolutely. Now, why are theologians going to come to this and try to, the literalists will try to say, oh, well, wait a minute. He's talking about the generation in the last days. No, it's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. He did a lot of rebuking before he left this place. Moses did the exact thing. He did a lot of rebuking because he said, I know what's going to happen. You're stubborn. And you're going to walk away from God and you're not going to listen to the things we taught you and told you. Did it happen? Absolutely. He also taught us about the right way to get things done. What an example Jesus was to you and me in that upper room when the apostles are sitting around jockeying for position in his new kingdom. They're being just like the people in the world and a lot of, like a lot of our religious leaders. You see, the apostles were emulating the religious leaders that lived right before them. And Jesus taught them the right way, and the wrong way. You see, Jesus said, I came to be served. I came to serve and not to be served. And then he gave a big example. And what was that example? He took off his outer cloak, took a basin of water, and began to wash all those in the room's feet. That job was reserved for what we would call a low, 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 low blue-collar worker that would do that. He demonstrated, God himself demonstrated to those apostles and to you and me and to us religious leaders how we're to behave ourselves and conduct ourselves amongst the people of God and the lost world. We are to be servants of the Most High God. And Peter, full of pride, in John 13 said, he came to Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? He said, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. And there's that emotional outburst that we have all done in our lives, and Peter did the same thing. You ain't washing my feet. Well, uh, some of your feet, if I, I saw them too, I probably wouldn't wash them either. He said... Lord, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus said, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And, of course, clearly telling us that we need the washing of the blood that we sang about a while ago. We need to be washed in the blood. Are you washed in the blood? Then Peter overreacts the other way. Went from one extreme to the other extreme, which we've all done. I'm not going to pick on Peter when I get to heaven. He could pick on you and me. All the things that we did do and didn't do. He said, well, okay. Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And then Jesus had to correct them theologically also. And when he said, those who've had a bath, those who've been saved, need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. Basically saying, no, you got saved, okay. You, you've, you've, you, you, sin no longer has a mastery over you, but yes, you, as you become like me, you are going to fail and stumble and sin. And I have provisions for you when that happens. And so you just need to ask me to forgive you. And I will. The big thing that he left us with in John was the right way to the Father. You see, 
you and me talk to many people and they try to tell us there are many paths that lead to God. How arrogant of you preachers and teachers and Christians that try to tell the whole world there's only one way to get to heaven. Well, the scripture clearly tells us that there's only one way to the Father. In John 14, he said to doubting Thomas, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Because Jesus said he's leaving them, but soon after they'll be able to be with him and they'll be able to follow him. Thomas is going, well, we don't know where you're going. Jesus said very clearly a passage we love to quote, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Mormonism. Hinduism, going to church, being good, giving all your money to the poor. No, there's only one way, he said, that's through me. You come unto the Father, you got to come through me. That's what he's saying. We've seen many television shows. Yeah, you can't come to him unless you come to me, man. You want to get to him, you got to come to me, right? You've heard that, some macho guy say that. Well, Jesus said, you, ain't, you aren't getting to him unless you come to me. But he said it in a little nicer way. Proverbs tells us there seems there, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. So all many, 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 many preachers and teachers and clergymen across America are not teaching this fundamental truth that Jesus is the only way they are beginning to compromise all throughout our land. Our churches are becoming weak because we have allowed this to be preached in our pulpits of America. Some of you are probably sitting here, well, preacher, I came here to feel good. and I'm not leaving so good. Listen, if you're a believer here and you love Jesus, this is all good stuff because you know it's the truth. If it's not coming across to you good, you, you might not know him. And you're offended. But I will leave you with this. The greatest thing, not only did Jesus pray for you and me, but he died for you and me. As I set the stage for next week when Jacob preaches on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we must not forget. It's a sad but happy time, but Jesus went to the cross for you and me. It's so easy to explain to everyone that Jesus Christ said that I would have to die for your sin. So when you're talking to people, as I had a chance to do it this week and explain to someone, a couple people this week, hey, listen, you're a criminal. What? I didn't do anything. Yeah. What do you mean you didn't do anything? You stood before God right now. We begin to judge you. There'd be a long unfolding list, right, of all the things that you and me have done and you haven't been caught. Those are criminal activities in God's kingdom. And someone has to pay a price for those criminal things that you did and that I did. How are you going to pay for it? God requires justice. He loves you. He loves you so much that he sent a son, but he requires justice for your rebellion and my rebellion. So Jesus said, listen, I'm going to take your punishment. I'm going to take your punishment. God's going to pour out his wrath that was meant for you, meant for you, and Jesus said, I'll take it. I'll take, I'll take it. And God poured out his wrath and his judgment on him instead of you and me. That's what he did for you and me. And the scripture tells us in Luke 23, two other men, both criminals, now there, there were the real criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. And when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there. Who crucified him? Well, the world did, but it began with the very people that God came to, first and foremost, to the Israelites. And they crucified him. But remember, everyone was involved in the crucifixion. The Romans were. You and me were. If there was no one in the world but just you, Jesus still had to come and die for you so that you could be forgiven. So there's no blame game here. I, I know there are many, many Jewish people maybe listening online or here. We're, we're not trying to blame like some old uh, ignoramus Christians or ignoramus, you know, Jewish Christians. 
this is just how it unfolded. He came to his own, and his own received him not. But to them that believe in him, to them he gave them the power to become sons of God. But here's what Jesus said while he was hanging there on the cross, enduring the wrath of God, the punishment. I've received beatings in my life, and I've received a beating with a cord this thick, probably about 30, 40 lashes. Nothing like our Lord and Savior did, who took the lashes of God for you and me, for every single act of rebellion that you and me have committed against him. He took it for you and me. That's the good news. It's a sad news, but it's good news, what Jesus did for you and me. Father, forgive them. That's what Jesus said. Forgive them. And then he began to say, after he received the drink, he said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up the spirit. So he died for you. Is that where it all ended? Well, just a little bit of a glimpse of what we're going to speak on next week. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. And the good news, Jesus told Mary, Martha, and the ladies, I am the resurrection, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. Seems like an oxymoron, right? And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Why did he do it? This is the last scripture I'll read in Hebrews 12 2. You're wondering, why did Jesus do all this? Why, why, why would he go to the nth degree to leave heaven and die for people that weren't even thinking about him? Their, their, their minds were not on him at all. It would be like you giving up your son for all the people in jail, and they could care less or not even thinking about your son, and your son takes the punishment for all the criminals in jail. That's exactly the picture we get. Nobody was thinking about him. Everyone has gone astray. There's none that seeketh after God. No, not one. You see the love that he has for you and me? Why, why did he do it? You kind of scratch your head and go, why did he do it? You have the answer? No, I won't put you on the spot. Here's the answer. Hebrews 12, 2. For the joy, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Scorning its shame, hanging out there, either almost naked or naked, we don't know for sure. The shame. And sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And the Bible says in Luke 15, 7, there is rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. Would you stand at this time, please? If you're here today, you've heard enough scripture. Or if you're looking in online, you've heard enough scripture to give your life to Jesus Christ, perhaps for the first time, or to rededicate your life back to God and say, God, I surrender. I want to live for you. We'd love to know about that. If you'll comment in the tag section and let us know, we'll be sure to get back in touch with you. If you're here today and you've decided to follow Jesus, we'd love to know that. Come forward while we're continuing to worship God. And I'll be up here and some others will be up here. To receive your prayer request, if you have any prayer needs. Or to say, you know, I want to come and be baptized. I've given my life to Jesus. If God's speaking to you today, please be obedient to him. We're preaching the saints, but perhaps some people have scooted in and they weren't saints yet. But they want to become one. That invitation is for you. What Jesus did on the cross. He said, it's finished. Are you saying, God, it's finished? I'm tired of my sin. I want eternal life. Would you make that decision today as we sing? So come on, my soul. Don't you get shout me a little your soul. Cause you've got a lie. Silence. Praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. 
Don't you give shout me live to be your song You've got a lion inside of all the lungs That praise the Lord Oh yeah Come on my soul, come on my soul Don't you give shout me live to be your song You've got a lion inside of all the lungs Get up and pray Come on, my soul, don't you kiss, shout me, little be your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs, so get up and praise the Lord. Oh, yeah. I sing that out of that chorus. And so I throw up my hands, praise you again. Chorus one more time. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. So that I had it. Oh, we got nothing left. We got nothing else. Come on, this is what he asked. So I know it's not much. You told the woman to give up. That was enough, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Come on, some of you need to sit in this moment for a little bit. Some of you need to confess some things. Some of you need to seek the Lord. Begin to cry out to him because he's here. Begin to call out to him because he's near. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Some of you need to lay some things down at his feet. The scripture says to come to the altar. All your brokenness, all your shame, all your hurt. And lay it at his feet. Lay it at his feet. And so can we just worship him just for a little bit longer? Oh, we worship you, Father. Oh, you are good, you are great. Come on, lift up your own song in this place. You need to pray, you need to kneel, you need to lift up your hands. Oh, we cry out to you. You are listening. We cry out to you, Father. We praise you, oh, we praise you, come on my soul, we cry out to you, come on my soul, oh, we lift up our voice, come on my soul, come on, some of you need to do some fighting, some of you need to do some crying, Lord, help me serve, help me love, help me worship you. Because we got too many things in our lives that are taking you away, too many distractions. And some of you need to lay those down today and say, God, let me only see you. Let me only see you, God. Would you stir something in me? Stir something in my soul. Stir something in my heart, God, that I may lift my song, lift my worship to you because you deserve it. Because you're worthy of it, Father. Come on, some of you tell him he's worthy. You're worthy of it. So come on, my soul. Come on, my soul, and don't you get shy on me to your soul. You've got a lion, so I'll get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me, lift 
Father, we worship you across this place. God, we're so grateful for you. Lord, we're grateful that you are our Redeemer. You are our Savior. And it's good to hear the truth of why you showed up. Well, you had to call some people out. And Lord, sometimes you got to call us out. Because we have strayed. How we live, how we speak, how we pray, how we teach. We have strayed. And so, Lord, would today be a reminder for us that you're not just drawing us in, but sometimes you've got to draw us back. You've got to draw us back to you, Father. Just like the lost sheep who you went after and you brought him back. Help us to not stray anymore. Help us to trust in you with all of our heart, to not lean on our own understanding, but in all of our ways acknowledge you. And you said that you will make our paths straight. So we thank you, Father. We praise you. In the name of Jesus, if you need prayer, we'll, we'll stick around. If you need prayer, come to the front. We'll have some, some of our prayer partners up here. If it's your first time, we got a gift for you at that blue tent. Don't forget to grab as many invite cards for Easter. Invite some people. And here's my question for you. Don't just hand a, somebody an Easter card, but who are you praying for? Would you consider praying for a few people this week? that God would be moving something inside their spirit already right now in this moment, that they would be drawing them to say, I've got to be at church on Easter Sunday. Church, we love you. You're dismissed. Stick around if you need, it. need prayer. Stick around if you need to uh, receive a touch of heaven. You're more than welcome to stick around. We'll see you next week.